All right, here we go. Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining me again. Uh-huh. And so I'm going to start with um, just a review, uh, again, a basic review of what we've covered so far. Um, in a way, we've, we've uh, covered two ways to arrive at the concepts of matter and form. One is by uh, reflection on change. And in a way, change exists, right? Because we are realists, we think that change exists. Therefore, matter and form exist and are real principles of change. And the other one we, we, um, we touched on briefly last time, uh, clearly in, 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 uh, not in depth and, and uh, we didn't cover all the nuances of it, but it's on the question of the multiplicity of individuals. Individuals exist, you know, of the same kind, you know, different dogs, different human beings, different trees. And therefore, matter and form exist and are real principles of being, right? Um, the change part was that change implies some, the persistence of something and then the acquisition of something new and matter is accounts for uh, the persistence. Uh, matter is the principle of potency which allows um, something to come to be not from non-being but from being in potency. And so matter is persists through the change. Form is the uh, what is acquired in the change. And, uh, and so w that is, uh, whether, whether we're talking about accidental change or substantial change, uh, we have that, uh, the same structure, uh, metaphysical structure for change. And then when it comes to the multiplicity of individuals in the same species, we, we invoked that there must be a principle of similarity between the different individuals, and that's the form um, uh, that's common to all the individuals in, in the species, but there must be something that individualizes each member of, of, um, of the species, and that's what we, what we call matter, what, what we refer to as matter. And then the, the two terms which are fundamental to the philosophy of nature, form and matter in Greek, you know, are, you know, give us uh, the, the word uh, hylomorphism. All right, so I wanna, uh, on this slide, I wanna just make a clarification. I've used the, the word species here. Um, I've used it uh, this time and last time when we talked about multiple individuals in a species. Um, uh, species is not um, exactly the same um, uh, meaning. It doesn't have the same meaning as the, the modern one when we talk about scientific species or biological species. It, it's a related meaning, but here it's a little more general. Um, if we go back to the concepts of substance that we covered um, before, and I said that you know uh, uh, a substance is a bearer of accidents, and therefore you know I'm a substance. This horse is a substance. That quantity of water is a substance because that particular quantity of water is either cold or hot, and it's here or there. You know it has some accidents. These are what are called primary substances. Um, in, in, using Aristotle's language. So he refers to, to these particular um, uh, individual substances as primary substances. And then he used the term secondary substance, which is essentially the species, when we talk more generally about the class of, of beings that are, that are the same. So if Michel Akkad is a, the primary substance, man or human being right, human being is the secondary substance. It's the species. If this horse is the primary substance, then horse in general, right, is, is the species. Uh, if this quantity of water is the primary substance, then water in general is the, the species, okay? So just a little clarification, we'll, we'll have a chance to, to come back to, to this point uh, later on in the, in the course. So we have, uh, primary and secondary substance, but we also have primary and secondary matter. And I introduced the term primary matter uh, in relationship to what persists in substantial change. So if we're talking about substantial change, then primary matter is the, uh, the principle that accounts for the persist, you know, whatever persists in the change. So when the armadillo dies and becomes a carcass, we have to we invoke the, the the presence of something called primary matter that persists in the change and primary matter will be the topic of of this lesson and the next okay so we'll get into this more and also i mentioned it briefly although it's, it's 
it it created a lot more controversy at the time, especially in the you know in the uh, in the Middle Ages. That primary matter is also what accounts for individuals in a species. Okay, secondary matter um, is what persists in an accidental change. For example, uh, if I get uh, sunburned, you know, I, me, the subject, uh, or or my skin, if you will, if you just want to focus on my skin, my skin is the subject of the accidental change, and my skin uh, turns from being pale to being red. Okay, so secondary matter refers to what persists in an accidental change. And it's also what accounts for the individual instances of accidental forms, okay? So, so secondary matter, my skin, accounts for the, uh, the individual instantiation of the color red because, you know, red now is in my skin, okay? All right, let's go into uh, uh, the concept of prime matter and uh, uh, that, as we said, is, is the substrate for substantial change. And we're going to start by contrasting that, contrasting that with our modern concept of matter, which is very, very different. If you think about matter, or if you Google matter, you know, and look at what image pops up, you get, you know, something like this, you know, matter are tiny little things that are very hard, <laughs> indivisible, and, and we can, you know, knock on them. They're extremely uh, solid. You know, that's what matter is, except if it's dispersed, then it becomes, you know, liquid. And if it's completely dispersed, then it becomes gas. So our concept of matter tends to refer to something really, really, uh, that's seemingly, uh, at least at some level, tangible. Um, it may be more, uh, uh, even more explicit when we, when we think about material. You know, if you, if you think about the material, you know, what's, you know, the, the matter to build a house, it can be wood, it can be stone. So th these are building materials. If you, again, if you Google material, you'll get this image that pops up. You know, different materials or cloth would be matter to make, uh, uh, you know, a dress or a curtain or something like that. So, so matter has this, uh, in our modern conception of it, has this notion of being um, maybe a building block. And as it turns out, that actually, um, was the case in in uh, ancient Greece? Uh, it had that um, that notion of building block was present, and I have in the um, or, or I will have in the lecture notes for this lesson a paper by uh, Father Norbert Norbert uh, Leuten. Um, it's it's uh, it's the transcript of a talk he gave in the 1950s uh, at, a, at at a conference on prime matter, I think it's, a, it's an ex outstanding paper to explain the concept of matter. But what he does, he, he uh, introduces the etymology of um, the word highly in Greek, uh, which is the word that you know, is now translated as matter. And, and highly for the Greek, before it had a philosophical significance, highly meant wood. Wood. As, it, as if, the, you know, the wood in the forest, right? The wood um, in the forest. And um, it, it was, or uh, uh, Leuten surmises, that it, it was used as to represent, uh, eventually, abstractly, to connote any kind of building material. Okay, that so highly was the wood, or maybe the stone, or something to to build a temple and or to, to build a house or to build a ship or whatever it is, okay? So that was the, the initial abstraction of the word highly or matter was from wood, wood from very basic primitive term. So, so you can imagine maybe a, a Greek uh, contractor uh, telling his, uh, you know, the, the owner of the, the project, he says, well, okay, the, the cost for the highly for this project is gonna be, you know, 10,000 drachme or whatever, you know, whatever it is. So the high lay was just building material, okay? Coming initially from wood to just representing building material, okay? Um, and we see, so, so if high lay is wood and then becomes building material, that out of which something is built, right? The building material is that out of which something is built, you can see in this the notion of potency, right? There's a notion of potency 
in that meaning. That's that out of something, you know. In a way, the house is in the potency of the stones, right? Or the, the ship is in the potency of the wood, or the dress is in the potency of the of the of the cloth. Okay, so that that notion of potency, uh, you know, seems to be there. Okay, and 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 that may be the the philosophical origin. But the Greek, the ancient Greek philosophers preceding Aristotle, um, so their concern was with, uh, you know, they, they, they were pondering uh, um, nature and they were pondering nature's interchanging nature, okay? So the fact that there is change, the fact that uh, certain things, perhaps certain simple things like water seem to be incorporated into more complex things like plants and even human beings and whatnot. So they wanted to explain what is the nature, you know, what makes uh, a tree a tree and what makes, you know, an animal be an animal and what makes, you know, so they, they were trying to, uh, to come up with uh, fundamental principles of, of nature. What are, the, what are the principles, the explanatory principles? How can we explain this natural world that we live in, that, that, that we are part of? How can we explain it, you know, given that we see uh, these things change into one another and perhaps simpler, simpler things being components of bigger things, okay? So, so they, they, um, uh, they latched on to this conception of matter as building block, Okay, they latched onto it. They saw many things in nature interchanging. And then the question was, is there an underlying, uh, or is the underlying common bond or, 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 you know, principle between all these existent natures, is there some matter in some sense of building block or wood that is the explanatory principle for everything that we see? Okay, so they were, they were trying to come up with some kind of, uh, of explanation based on the idea of building, building block. Okay, and famously, you have Thales, you know, who proposed that water is the fundamental material principle of nature. Okay, or one of his followers, uh, uh, Anax, uh, Anaximander, Anaximenes, I don't know, I can't remember which one is which, saying that, you know, air is a fundamental material principle of water. And we'll go over Thales and Anaximenes and Anaximander in more detail later on. But here, basically, I just want to uh, uh, point out that the pre-Socratic philosophers, you know, had come up with for the concepts of matter, they had come up with the idea that there might be some building blocks. And here, this is uh, Empedocles, you know, who, who uh, proposed that air, water, fire, and earth were, you know, the, the multiple basic fundamental building blocks of the natural world. And on the basis of these fundamental highly or, or building blocks, you could, you could explain, you know, everything else. Okay. And so that was the, uh, uh, that's the beginning, but but there's a problem because if the question is uh, is the underlying common bond between all existent natures between between all existence existent things I, I should say here between all existent things between trees and plants and carcasses and animals and human beings and whatnot if the underlying common bond is some kind of building block or wood the problem is that if it's a specific wood a specific time of building block, the notion of potency becomes threatened because in the, in the wood itself, if you say it's going to be air, or it's going to be water, or it's going to be this, or it's going to be that, there is a determination. There's a specificity. Okay. And that in a way threatens the, the, the idea of, of potency, particularly potency in substantial change. And so, so this is where Aristotle, as we will see in, in our next uh, segment here, this is where Aristotle comes in and defines matter in a very different way. So he will define matter to really preserve the concept of potency and eliminate from it any kind of specificity or determination. So it's not going to be water. It's not going to be, you know, uh, air or this or that. It's not going to be any, any, it's going to be no this and no that. It's going to be, you know, as we will see, pure potency. Okay. So let's take a break here, and then we'll, uh, in the next segment, uh, we'll uh, look at what Aristotle proposes and, and his con conception of, of matter, which is uh, prime matter we've, we've talked about so far. Any questions here before we come back? Or No. 
Okay. All right. So let me stop here and we'll be right back.